Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. Today we're going to look into chapter 27 of A-Level Physics, Alternating Current. And this is the chapter outline. Now first, let's define what alternating current is. As implies by its name, it is current that flows in alternating directions. For example, for the first period of the time cycle, the current will flow in this direction. And in another half of the cycle, the current will flow in another direction. Well, I have this diagram to help you visualize how they work. You know that current is just the flow of electron. You can just picture the alternating current as electrons that can flow in both direction. In this case, to the left and then to the right. And as for the alternating current, their shape is a sinusoidal graph, means a sine graph. This means that the current follows a smooth repeating sine graph. It is similar to simple harmonic motion. And because they are following the sinusoidal pattern, you can see that the amount of current varies at different time interval. For example, at this point, the current is one ampere. And just a few milliseconds later, they might be at a lower value. So how do we figure out what is the value of the current at a particular time. And this is when we have an equation for sinusoidal alternating current to help you to figure out the instantaneous current. So this is the equation. IO is the peak current, which you can also see it as the amplitude of the graph, followed by sine, then angular frequency and time. By substituting all the values, you can find out the current at a particular time. So just a recap on how to calculate angular frequency and how you can further break down frequency into one over period. We can calculate instantaneous voltage by using this formula. Everything is the same except for now, the amplitude will be the peak voltage. So these are the alternating current and alternating voltage graph. Now we have looked into what instantaneous current and instantaneous voltage are. There are also instantaneous power, for example, because if an electrical component is dependent on alternating current, their power will also change so some evidence would be a fluorescent lamp may appear to flicker. And because of this, we can't just use the instantaneous current and voltage to calculate the power of a device. Because if we were to try to use the peak value of current or voltage to calculate power, the answer would likely be too high. This is why we need a value that can be plugged into the power equation. And that's when we have the root mean square current slash voltage. This root mean square current or voltage tell us the value of a direct current of voltage that would deliver the same power as the alternating one. Let's say an AC with a root mean square current of 2 ampere, they would deliver the same power as a steady 2 ampere direct current. But the problem, as you can see in the graph, is how do we calculate the root mean square value based on the amplitude, which is the peak current or peak voltage? That's when we have this equation. If you want to calculate the root mean square current or voltage, you can use this equation, which is around 70% of the peak current or voltage. So I have this graph to illustrate to you the difference between root mean square value and AC. So in this case, the peak current is 15 ampere. So you, if you were to plug in the equation here, you will find out that the root mean square value is 10.61, so which is around this value here. So we are saying that if the AC has a peak current of 15 ampere, they are actually equivalent to 10.61 ampere of direct current. And if you were to let the RMS value divided by the peak current, you'll get exactly this amount of percentage. Well, some of you may be worrying about the negative part of it. Wouldn't it affect the power? But do note that power depends on I square and not I. So even if the I is negative, it will still be converted to positive when we square it. So the average of I square over one cycle is half the peak current square. So one thing you have to take away from all this is that you have to use the RMS value, either voltage or current, when you're calculating power. Do not use the peak values, otherwise they will give you the wrong result. To help you to practice, I have a work example here. An electrical heater is connected to this amount of voltage and it has a resistance of 60 ohm. What is the RMS current? So the given information is that this is the RMS voltage. So I could just simply use the V equal to IR formula to use the voltage divided by resistance. I would have gotten the RMS current. So the next question asks us to figure out the peak current, which I have already shown you the formula, which is this one. So you can just substitute your RMS current into the equation, multiply by square root two, that will give you the peak current of the device. Last but not least, the power dissipated by the heater. This is sort of a trick question. You have calculated two current, 4 ampere 
and 5.66. Which one should you use? I reminded everyone that we should all use the RMS value. That's why I only use the value 4 in my equation. With that, we have the power dissipated by the heater. And now in the next part of the video, we're going to look into what rectifier is. Rectifier is used when you want to convert alternating current into direct. We need to do that because there are certain devices that can only work with DC. So there are a few rectification methods. The first one is half wave rectification. What you can do is to put a diode into your circuit and when the current is flowing in this direction, nothing will get affected. But in the other half of the cycle, the diode is going to block the current from flowing in another direction. So you can see from this graph here, when you have a half wave rectification, in the first half of the cycle, current can flow. In other half, current cannot flow. But this is not very useful. What if the equipment just need to access current all the time? That's when we have full wave rectification. So this is how you can set up a full wave rectification. So how does it work? Now, in the first cycle, when current is flowing in this direction, say the current flowing from the left to the right, and according to this arrangement, current can only flow through this diode and then get into whatever component you have here and then exceed through it this channel, all right? So what we want to do is that in another half of the cycle, we want to make sure that this part, the current is still flowing the same way because some electrical component relies on direct current. That's why in another half of the cycle, say the current is now flowing in another half. So it's flowing here. Then because of the arrangement of the diode, now they are flowing in this direction. And as you can see, when the current flow here, it is the same direction as what we did just now. So which is, if you were to compare both, even though the current has flown in two different directions, you can see that inside this circuit here, the current is flowing in the same direction. Yeah. So this is the power of full wave rectification. Next up, we'll talk about how to smooth out the output, which from here to here. Before that, you have to understand the concept of ripple. After rectification, the output voltage is not perfectly flat. Instead of a steady line, they might fluctuate slightly, and these are called ripples. They are small variation in the DC voltage after rectification. It happens because the rectify voltage rises and falls within the AC cycle. And because of that, you need a capacitor across the output, you add it inside your circuit. So this capacitor, they charges up when the voltage rises, and this charges when the voltage drops, which gives you a graph like that and it fills in the gap between the peak and the valley. So instead of looking at it like that, it fills in the gap between peak and valleys, flattening the output. There are a few factors that will affect the amount of ripples. First is how big is the capacitance of your capacitor. If your capacitors has a high capacitance, this leads to slower discharge. Because they store more charge, it takes longer time to empty the tank. And if your capacitor has a low capacitance, it has a higher discharge. It discharges faster. Another factor is the resistance. So if your circuit has high resistance, it also leads to slower discharge because high resistance means less current. And if you have a low resistance, then it leads to faster discharge. The two values here actually contributes to the time constant, which is RC. To summarize, a large time constant leads to slower discharge, less ripples, and a small time constant leads to faster discharge, more ripples. I know it's pretty abstract, so I have a work example to help everyone understand it. Say I have this scenario here. This power supply needs a steady DC voltage, and after rectification, the time between each peak voltage is 10 milliseconds. Two amplitude is 10 milliseconds. Say your resistance is 2K, and your capacitor is 100 microfarad. So should you use the capacitor? To understand this question, you have to first figure out what is the time constant. The time constant tells you how fast the capacitor discharges. So after calculation, I figure out that the time constant is 0 0.2 seconds, and the time between the voltage peak is 10 milliseconds. And because the time constant is much greater than the peak interval, the capacitor won't discharge much before the next peak, and hence the capacitor should be used. Now, if I were to change the capacitance value a little bit, I make it smaller. As you know, smaller capacitance leads to faster discharge. So if you calculate the um, time constant, it will now be reduced by 10 times. And as compared to 10 milliseconds, this one microfarad capacitor is very ineffective because the voltage will drop significantly between peak because it will discharge very quickly. And because of that, we should not use this capacitor. So to show you the difference, I have this graph here. This is when you have a large time constant, which leads to better smoothing. But if your time constant is very small, like this example here, 
that's when your voltage will drop very quickly between the peak. And as a result, this leads to ineffective smoothing. And this is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.